Welcome, welcome everyone to Europe 1973, episode four, The Road to Venice. In this episode, we follow Richard and David Brewer on the road to Venice. It's part of their little summer vacation they took in 1973. The road to Venice starts in Spain, down to the Mediterranean coast, and then across the Spanish, French, and Italian Riviera. Venice itself is the star of episode four. We feast on the city of Venice, that great and ancient city. Watch it all the way to the end. Don't leave early. Now, after the Europe 1973 episodes are completed, and there will be five of them, we will publish a prologue and an epilogue with personal stories of the year before and the year after the summer of 73. For now, it's the road to Venice. Let's get started. The flags of Spain, France, and Italy the countries we visit on the road to Venice. This map shows the 10 places with dates where we camped overnight on the road to Venice. Here are shots from the border between France and Spain, very beautiful in the Pyrenees Mountains. On July 20th, 1973, back in the States, the War Powers Act passed in the U.S. Senate. Later, in 1973, the act became law over President Nixon's veto. And, oh yes, of course, we are still wrangling over the War Powers Act in 2023. But let's move on. On the night of July 20th, we camped in the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain. On July 21st, we headed south out of the mountains, and when we got down to lower elevations, the temperature rose into the 90s. Here's a shot of me cooling off somewhere on the road in Spain on July 21st. We camped near Lerida on the night of July 21st and then rode down to Tarragona, a city on the Mediterranean coast about 40 miles west of Barcelona. We had reached the Riviera and didn't depart from it until July 30th. We spent two nights in Barcelona, July 22nd and 23rd. Barcelona is the second largest city in Spain with a metro population of 3.6 million in 1973. Today's population is 5.7 million. Barcelona is a picturesque city with many attractions, including spectacular architectural sites. Barcelona is a very desirable destination. Barcelona's football club won its championship in the 1973-74 season. Football, that's soccer to you and me. Here, Johan Cruyff, seen here, was named European Footballer of the Year in 1973, his first season with Barcelona. And Barcelona is a football power today in 2023. Ah, the south of France and the French Riviera. On July 24th, we said goodbye to Barcelona and to Spain and hello to France once again. Here, a painting by American artist Stokely Webster titled View from the Terrace, French Riviera, 1973. The Riviera is a very scenic route. There are spectacular back-to-back -back tunnel and bridge sections on the coast roads and so many iconic places to stop and explore. There are options for the precise path from place to place, as is often typical of coastal regions. It was a lot to take in. On July 24th, we camped at Le Bacares, France, and on the 25th, we camped at Arles in the south of France. Arles is where Vincent van Gogh lived in 1888 and 1889. He created more than 300 paintings and drawings there, including some of his most important works, 
and Arles is where he was when he cut off his own ear in a mysterious act of self-mutilation. Here's an image of the map with a close-up now, this time looking closer, showing our overnight stops in France. On July 26th, we camped at Marseille, and on July 27th, at Nice. We did pass through Toulon and also through Cannes, the site of the annual film festival. We spent two nights, July 27 and 28, camping in Nice and exploring the area. On July 29th, we stopped in Monaco, the site of annual Formula One motor races. We were on the very streets that are used by the Formula One cars during the Grand Prix. Very exciting. Here the race course as it was reworked for the Grand Prix race in 1973. These are all city streets. Here, the Los hairpin turn in 1973. I want to talk about the Flying Scott, Jackie Stewart. He was a British Formula One driver and he had a great year in 1973. Here's Jackie in his car at Monaco in 1973. In 1973, Jackie Stewart won five Formula One races. Monaco, of course, and he also won the South African, the Belgian, the Dutch, and the German races. And he had announced before the season started that he would retire at the end of the season. But he retired from racing the day before the last race of the season in October 1973, just before the U.S. Grand Prix in Watkins Glen, New York. This was to be his 100th Grand Prix race. Two tragic deaths on the Grand Prix circuit in 1973 are the answer to why the Flying Scott, Jackie Stewart, retired before that race. On July 29th, the very day we were in Monaco at another Formula One race, English driver Roger Williamson was killed racing the Dutch Grand Prix. Then in October, during the Saturday qualifying events for the U.S. Grand Prix, Stewart's teammate, Francois Sever, was killed in an accident on, on the notorious S's. Jackie did not race on Sunday. In fact, the entire Tyrell Lotus team withdrew from the race. Even though he didn't participate in the last race of the season, he won the Drivers' Championship in 1973. And when he retired, Stewart held the record for the most wins by a Formula One driver, 27. And that record held for 14 years. Jackie went on in motorsports as a broadcaster and an advocate for better safety. 1973 was a very significant year for Jackie Stewart. By the way, he suffered a mild but scary stroke in June 2023. Today, Jackie, who is 84 years old, has fully recovered. We say goodbye to France for the second time. There is a third visit to France in our little summer vacation in 1973. That shows up in episode five. So you'll want to tune in to episode five to learn about France again. Here's the map, another close up showing the places and dates where, where we camp overnight in Italy. <clears throat> on the night of July 29th, we rode to Cogolito, Italy, and on June 30th, we traveled to Pisa. I really loved Pisa, Italy. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is the bell tower of the cathedral. The tower and cathedral are in the Square of Miracles, a compound with multiple sacred buildings. It is really an awesome site that left a lasting impression upon me. The structure has needed remedial work to prevent a catastrophe. There was a major operation to strengthen the tower that was completed in 2001, stabilizing and very slightly 
straightening the tower. Engineers have estimated that the tower will remain stable for at least 200 years. So there's still time for you to visit this wonderful and impressive place. Pisa is wonderful. You should see it. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you. You are awesome. And don't click away. Don't leave now. We're almost in Venice and we have lots of great images of that ancient city. On July 31st, we camped in Ferrara and on August 1st, we rode into Venice. We camped just outside for six nights and every day we went into Venice and spent the days exploring the city on foot. Here is Richard's setup at the Venice campsite. The Grand Canal is the main artery in Venice. And I think no narration is really needed here. Just look at the Grand Canal for a minute. the Rialto Bridge over the Grand Canal. And here, two smaller canals for comparison. And now, the Bridge of Size, S-I-G-H-S, -S, the Bridge of Size. The subject of a film that I want to recommend and the trailer for the film is linked in the description. A Little Romance is a very good film from 1979, directed by George Roy Hill. The movie features two teenagers running away together and around Europe in the 1970s. Laurence Olivier is in the film and he's great. It is not a spoiler for me to tell you that The Bridge of Sighs is a feature in the film's storyline. A Little Romance has amazing images of Venice and of other iconic sites in Europe in the 1970s. Definitely worth it. Now back to our trip. Here's one of the streets in Venice just to let you know that everything isn't waterways. Richard had the camera, as always, and he took pictures of things that interested him. Food, of course. Just look. Now here's an image that features Richard. Can you see him? It's a bit difficult. This second one is easier. Do you see him now? Richard was no doubt intrigued by what was behind the glass, but his appearances in those reflections has always been one of the stories of the trip. While we were in Venice, Richard had his 31st birthday. August 5th, 1973. Happy birthday, Richard. Don't leave, don't leave now. The remaining images of Venice are the best. Athens Airport. On the world stage on August 5th, 1973, two terrorists from the Palestinian terrorist group, the Black September Organization, attacked innocent travelers waiting in the Athens airport to board a, a flight to New York City, killing three and seriously injuring 55. Their target 
was any Israeli traveler. Black September was the group responsible for the Munich massacre at the 1972 Olympic Games. The two terror terrorists were apprehended, tried, and sentenced to death by Greek courts, but were later released and deported to Libya. Now, we start our final series of images in Venice. Our focus is the Piazza San Marco, or St. Mark's Square. What you see here is a plot plan of the plaza. At the top is the church, the basilica. The large space in front of the basilica is the piazza, where you see the bell tower as the squarish shaped structure in the plaza. On the right is the Lagoon of Venice. On the next slide, you're gonna see me at a taxi stand over there by the lagoon. The square is an amazing attraction. It consists of two plazas, a small plaza, the Piazzetta, which connects the main plaza, the Piazza, to the waterway of the lagoon. The two spaces together form the social, religious, and political center of Venice and are referred to together. Here I am at a taxi stand on the waterway of the lagoon near the south end of the Piazzetta, the small plaza. Over my left shoulder on the other side of the waterway of the lagoon stand two important and impressive structures. First is the art museum, Punta della Dogana, and then the Church of St. Mary, Basilica di Santa Maria. And here you can see both the museum and the church all in one shot. Now, on to the main plaza, the Piazza San Marco. Looking toward the basilica, excuse me, looking forward toward the basilica, and you can see the bell tower there in the piazza. Here are two shots of the clock tower on the piazza. And here, a child feeding the birds on the square. One of my favorite shots in the summer of 1973. And another shot on the main plaza. Now, some detail of the exterior of the basilica. There's a front view of the entrance. Here's an oblique view. Here are two details over the main entry. The Basilica is the third church on the site. It expresses the wealth and power of Venice. Facades and walls are embellished with precious stones and rare marble. The interior of the basilica is a feast for the eyes, and some might say for the soul. Some of the interior domes, vaults, and upper walls are covered with gold ground mosaics depicting biblical scenes. Gold ground is a term for a style of images with all or most of the background in a solid gold color, achieved in this case with real gold leaf feast on the interior and i won't narrate right now just feast your eyes but stay tuned at the end of these interior shots i will come back to have a brief word before the end of today's episode
thank you for watching The Road to Venice today. Venice is awesome. This photo of the little girl on the plaza is my favorite from episode four. She's in a world of her own, and I think she has no thought of the awesomeness of her surroundings. In the summer of 1973, I was in a world of my own as well. Even now, I may not fully grasp the effects, the inheritance, the divine endowment, if you will, of my decision to follow Jesus Christ. 50 years on, and I still have more to grow and more to learn in my relationship with him. Europe 1973 will continue with episode five that will be released around August 26th. I hope to see you then. Bye for now.